The, the the band is a little way softer than the vocals, like we're standing way right in front of it. Maybe or lower us and then turn everybody up. Um, go to the bridge.
just to know you. Jesus, there's no one beside you. Wherever Okay, we're just coming to get you.
morning. Let's stand together and we sing praise the Lord this morning. Lord, in, re in return, we have nothing of value, Lord, but our worship. So we reach out this morning and worship you. And we ask that you lift us in your arms, Lord, that we become more active in our worship. And may the distractions of this world and this Lay at your feet, Lord. We come to your business. So wonderful is your unfailing love.
Turn around and greet some of the church this morning. taken from 2 Corinthians 1, verse 3 to 4. Praise be to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of our co all comfort, whose comfort us in all our troubles, so that we can comfort those in any trouble with comfort we ourselves receive from God. 1 Chronicles 29, 11. Yours, O Lord, is the greatest and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty. Indeed, everything that is in the heavens and the earth, yours is the dominion, O Lord, and you exalt yourself as head over all. Give life, you are love, 
of the sweetest of loves when my heart becomes free and my shame is undone your presence Lord and Holy Spirit you are welcome here come flood this place and fill the atmosphere your glory God is what our hearts long for to be overcome by your presence Lord oh God your presence Lord presence Let us experience the glory of your goodness. Let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your goodness. Let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your goodness. Let us become more aware of your presence. Let us
rest so many things on their mind, Lord. May we experience your peace in this morning. We thank you for your love. We thank you again for being here with us this morning. We pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Good morning, Oak Ridge Adventist Church. How are you guys? How's everybody feeling this morning? Wasn't that an awesome song? <laughs> That's my new favorite worship song. I'm just like on cloud nine every time. If you are the owner of a white Ford, unfortunately I don't know what model or license plate number, but I presume there's probably not a ton of white Fords out there, but I guess there's a lot. Your lights are still on, so you can wait about three minutes, and then when nobody's watching, you can get up. <laughs> Last week we began uh, the process of uh, a survey for all of you in the pews so that we can get a little bit more data about what we're doing well and what we could be doing better. So we've got some young people that I think are ready to come with some surveys and some pencils. Just wondering why they're not in here yet. Are they? Oh, right there. Sorry, I'm blind as a bat. Okay. Whoa. It's like really loud here. I'm trying uh, to make sure that you don't fill this out if you filled it out last week. So can we just have those, even if you're a visitor, even if you're not a member, even if this is the first time you've ever been here to our church, we want to invite you to fill this survey out. But only those that didn't fill it out last week. Last week we had about 200, 220 surveys returned. So if you filled it out last week, don't raise your hand, but we're going to get the girls to stand up right now. And if you didn't fill it out last week, raise your hand, and they will come around with a survey and a pencil. So we've got some ladies here and some people in the front. So if you didn't fill it out last week, please raise your hand nice and high, and these girls will get you that. And the band's going to play, Joey's going to play some piano here a little bit for the next uh, four or so minutes and you'll have an opportunity to fill that out. We want it before the end of the survey. Please keep it anonymous, don't put your name on it. We're just collecting some data so we can understand our congregation a little better, what we're doing well, what we need to do better at, and uh, what your needs are. So please take that time, fill that out, and before the service is out, we'll have ushers at each door, and you can drop that survey off with one of those ushers. So please raise your hands high if you've yet to fill this out, thanks.
Morning Church. So on Monday, I was catching a flight. Oh, my wife's waving to me. Hi. I love you too, I know. Kids, what age, Rich? Three to ten. Uh, if your age is three to ten, it's uh, Bible story time. We're taking offering too? Oh my lord, I've got to get up. It's Pastor Steve, that's what. Pastor Steve. Kids, boys and girls, come on up. I'm too, I'm too sick to, to get up. Awesome. Come on up. Have a seat right here on the stage. Let's look. Oh my goodness, where did all these kids come from? There's a lot of them. Hi, guys. Sure, make yourself comfortable. That's fine. Go ahead. All right, do you guys know that you have uh, story time today in the library? I bet you're going to have a fun activity as well. All right, raise your hand if you have a green cup. Green, raise your hand if you have blue. Let me see if you have blue. Raise your hand if you have red. Ooh, those are the special colors. That is awesome. All right, you're going to take the kids' uh, offering, and then we're going to dismiss you to the very back where Mrs. Dixit is waving, right back there. You're going to give her the money, and then she'll take you to um, kids' story time as well, okay? All right, let's have a word of prayer. Father God, we just thank you for these boys and girls, and God, we're just so grateful to be able to have a church where so many kids are here, and where they're able to learn and discover who you are. And today, God, as they take up this kid's offering, Lord, I pray that it'll be used in a way that every child of this church gets to experience the love of Jesus. And as these kids are uh, heading out to, uh, to Bible story time, Lord, may they have a, 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 an amazing experience learning who you are and having a, a time together in your holy name. Amen. All right, boys and girls, go ahead and you don't have a bucket yet? Well, Pastor Steve will give you one, okay? You can choose whatever color you want. That's awesome. So on Sunday, I was, uh, on Monday, Monday, I flew out of Abbotsford Airport. Have you ever flown out of the Abbotsford Airport? It is awesome. Like, I'm like, why am I always flying out of YVR? Like, this is like, Amazing. There's nothing there, right? It takes like two minutes. And so I was on the airplane flying to Lacombe, uh, Alberta. And uh, when I was on the airplane, I had this like tickle, just this like kind of scratch in my throat. And I thought, first, I'm a germaphobe, so I thought it's all that recycled air, you know, that they're putting into the airplane. And then I thought maybe I had something stuck in my throat. And then I got to... Uh, my hotel, and for the next two days, I was like sick with a fever. I was sleeping in my hotel alone, uh, not going to any meetings. My wife, I called her, and if you know my wife, she does not have the gift of nursing. And so I told her how sick I was, and she was like, well, good luck. And so I flew back on Thursday, and you would think after three or four days, you'd be better, right? but I'm still sick with the fever right now, and if there's any doctors or nurses, I really could use a Z-Pack right about now, so please talk to me after church. Hey, y'all ready to do this? I'm saying that more for my sake than really your sake, okay? Uh, I, have a, I have something I wanna call the tale of two sermons, because I wrote a sermon earlier this week called uh, Does the Bible Contradict Itself? And uh, yesterday, I was like really, really high on drugs. I took like all sorts of narcotics. Like some of it wasn't even in like packaged. I mean, they were just like red color. I figured I might as well just take it. And so I woke up yesterday afternoon and I was like, I have a different sermon to give. And so I wrote this sermon like completely high on drugs. So I don't know like if it's gonna make sense now. It made sense when I was writing it, okay? But the, <laughs> but the sermon, Does the Bible Contradict Itself? We're going to have to wait for that for another time, okay? That, we're not going to do that today. So let me give you a review of, of last week. 
Last week, we talked about three things. We talked about the origin of the Bible, how the Bible came together. And the first thing that I shared with you was that that there's no original manuscript that exists. In fact, um, there's the earliest uh, manuscripts that we have seen is is probably from, you know, the the, the 50s, right, Uh, um, B.C., and, and, and then the second point that I shared with you was that the Bible was compiled by what? You can read now, right? The Bible was compiled by what? By committee, right? And, and then a third one was, you must have faith to believe how it came together. Now, I got to tell you something. I, 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 I preached this sermon last week, and um, I probably got the most response and feedback from this particular sermon that I have in any sermon I've preached here at Oak Ridge. Uh, there, there were groups of people that came up to me after church, uh, cheering me on. They were thrilled. They were, they were high-fiving me. They were like saying, oh man, thank you for being honest and, and giving us a, 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 a real, we've never heard a pastor preach a sermon where you basically said, you know what, it's not a perfect bow tie that you can just tie together and it works all together. Uh, there's questions, there's issues, there's mystery in the Bible. And, and thank you for, 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 for sharing that and, and not claiming that we have all the answers. And then there were other people as well who weren't cheering me on. And they were like uh, really angry. And they were, they, they, were, they were pointing fingers like that. They pointed that particular finger right there at, in my face. And they were angry. They said, this is like the worst sermon I've ever heard in my life. How dare you do this to us? Like, how can you shake us and, and, and make us think that it all doesn't come together? And these are people like in my, in my face, right, after church. And then I got like some angry emails, you know, of people who were not happy with me. With me and, 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 you know, it, it was a mix. And you know what I like is that what what is happening is a discussion is taking place and that is that you as church members and me as your pastor have to wrestle through issues that are not being spoon-fed to you but you have to be able to have the intelligence on your own to really do the research and discover whether or not um, you believe how the bible came together are you following me and what i realized was is that possibly i moved too quickly last week uh, for some people, your, your faith was so shaken. You were so shocked that the Bible wasn't like from the King James Version, that Jesus didn't use that, that like, you, you didn't even know what to do with yourself. You, you, you didn't even know how to really even like uh, face your own Christianity. And so what I thought is that, you know, have you ever been in, an, did you ever take a science class or a math class where the teacher went too far ahead and too quickly? You ever had a teacher like that? The whole class is failing, okay? But the teacher doesn't care that the class is failing. The teacher just knows that there's 12 chapters that need to be accomplished this semester, and they're going to just gun right through whether or not you get it or not. Have you ever had a teacher like that? Mr. Martin, are you a teacher like that? (laughs) I knew it. Phil, is your birthday tomorrow? Happy birthday, Phil. You know, Eli, my son's birthday is tomorrow. You guys are like twinsies. So, you know, sometimes you have teachers that go too quickly. And so what I realized is that maybe instead of just jumping ahead and and moving along and forging along, maybe we need to go a little bit slower. We need to just unpack a few things. Because what I'm afraid of is that some people here are going to lose their faith because they've never really explored or even thought through the ideas that perhaps um, the Bible is more complicated than what we really imagined. So we're going to do a little kind of a, a... we're going to go backwards uh, today, and, and I want to just make a couple things very clear. And one thing is that what we mentioned last week is that Bible knowledge is at, and comprehension is at an all-time low. Do you believe that? People just don't read their Bible. They don't understand their Bible. They don't have a full understanding. And so when you have the Bible and the knowledge of the Bible that is so far behind, what you have to then expect is that the people in the pews are not going to fully, fully be with you. Because you can't teach master's degree courses on Sabbath morning when people are at a fourth to fifth grade level. Are you following me? And so you have to kind of go backwards a little bit and really help people understand uh, what we're going after. One of the things that people often ask, 
about Oak Ridge Church. You know, it's so funny because this church has drums all of a sudden, like everyone thinks it's like just this watered down church. You know, it's like, oh, they have drums. They must be stupid, you know. And, 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 and what, I, what I think we have to realize is that when you have a contemporary worship style, it doesn't mean that you're going to be watering down the message of Jesus. Are you following me? And so the question we have to ask ourselves is, are we watering down the gospel on Sabbath morning? And my answer to you is that we're not watering down the gospel. What we're doing is that we're wetting appetites. Because what we realize is that if people aren't fully immersed in understanding the Bible, then they're never going to fully understand who Jesus is. And so you've got to give people kind of a taste, uh, kind of a teaser on who Jesus is. And, and the hope is, is that once people get their appetites wet, then they're going to go deeper and understand who Jesus is. So then the Christians, seasoned Christians, the question that many people often ask then is, oh, Kumar, if you're, if you're preaching such uh, minimalistic sermons, if you're teaching uh, Bible, Bible messages that are so basic, then what's the point of me coming to church as a seasoned Christian? Have you ever had people ask you that? You know, why am I coming here? I should go to a deeper church. Well, you probably should then. Uh, my, my answer very quickly to you is the reason why we come to church on Sabbath morning is for one reason only, and that is to worship and exalt God. Amen. Okay, that, that's the only reason we come. Uh, it's not for me to teach you. It's not for me to, to help you learn. You know, that all will come as part of worship experience. But, but the number one reason why we do worship is to give glory to God. And as a result of that, when you do that, then out of the corporate worship, what happens on Sabbath morning is two things. Number one is evangelism, and number two is Bible teaching. Uh, I, I think in the last three years, you, you, you can probably admit that I have never once preached a sermon that was not based out of the Bible. I, I, I'm not a topical preacher. I'm always what you call an expository preacher. I will typically always preach out of a Bible text, right? Oh, that's me here. So I was getting mad that somebody wouldn't turn their phone off. And this something on here that's evil. So am I making sense today? Because I feel like I'm so drugged out, I may not be talking. Y'all being polite. Wife? Good. Well, thank you, Mark. Does this guy have like the best voice ever? Like, dude, you need to be a preacher, man. So. All right, so evangelism and Bible teaching, that's what we do on Sabbath morning. Did you hear what I just said? Somebody say evangelism. Somebody say Bible teaching. So the point on Sabbath morning is that if you're going to worship God, then the two things that we're going to do here on Sabbath is to reach people who don't know Jesus, which means that the messages are going to be practical and they're going to be basic. So then the next question is, well, Kumar, if you're teaching practical questions, how am I going to grow as a Christian? And my answer to you is that you grow as a disciple during the week. Okay, that's not the role on Sabbath morning. Your role, only job on Sabbath morning is to worship God and to edify him. But you grow during the week by studying your Bible. Now, look at the next slide. Uh, have you recognized these terms here at Oak Ridge Church? Wednesdays together, small groups, sermonic small groups, Van City groups, uh, upcoming Man About Marriage that's coming up next month. Have you heard of these things before? Now, the only reason why we do these things and we offer these things is so that our church members grow deeper in their faith with Jesus by going deeper in the Word of God. Okay? So the reason why we do that is for you to have opportunities during the week to grow deeper in God. And if you're not doing that, then you're not following up on your discipleship and your understanding of who Jesus is. And then the last thing that I, that I want to say is that you have to be able to have a weekly attendance in church. Okay? You know, I was doing a kind of a survey in my head of all the complainers in the church. And uh, I was making a list of them. I wrote them down. And, and, and I noticed that the, you know who the complainers in this church are? They're, they're, they're the inactive members of Oak Ridge. They're, they're the people who don't come here on a weekly basis. And so what happens is that if you're not here on a weekly basis, you're going to miss out on what we're doing and what we're trying to get done. 
And so when you come here and you're looky-loo and you come to other churches and you kind of show up here once in a blue moon and then you don't like what you hear, then you're going to complain about it because you're not invested in where we're headed. And so I've said this before and I'm going to say it again. If you don't come here regularly, go to the church that you go to. They probably need you more than we do, okay? But the point is, don't go to a church just like once or twice a month. Go to a church every week and invest in that community so that you can grow as a disciple with those people in your church. Am I sounding mean? Okay, because I want to be honest uh, with you. Now, now, some of you are saying, oh, Kumar, you know, I didn't know that this was a strategy, that, that worship was the edification, and that, that our responsibility was during the week. Well, let me tell you where you would learn that at, and that is on our new members class that we offer. And if you don't go to a new members class, then that's where you're not hearing where the strategy is, because this is where we share it every month. So I want to encourage you, if you're a longtime member, uh, come to this class, because this is going to explain to you exactly why we do what we do here at our church. Let's look at Lo Hosea chapter 4, verse 6. It says, my people are what? destroyed from knack, lack of knowledge. The point is, is that if you don't have a full understanding of who God is, you're going to be destroyed as a Christian. And the only way that you can fully understand who God is, is if you are in his word, because the Bible is God's description for, God, uh, for humanity and his plan for salvation. So if you want to know what God's plan is for your life, then you have to be willing to invest in learning and reading the Bible. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 2. Paul writes to the church of Corinth, and he says, I had to feed you with what? With milk. Why did he feed them with milk? Because they were what? Baby Christians, right? And when you have a baby, a baby cannot eat solid food immediately. The baby's only going to be drinking milk first, right? He says, I had to feed you with milk, not with solid food, because you weren't ready for anything stronger. But then he says, and you still aren't ready. Oak Ridge Church, let us not be the church that is only drinking milk. Uh, we have to be the church that is solid food Christians, and the only way that you become solid food Christians is by reading your Bible and understanding what the Bible has to say to you. And when you fully understand the value of the Bible and how it came together, and you, ha you have no questions about that, then what happens is, is that then your life is going to be much more confident in what you believe. You're not going to be shaken. You're not going to be mad and writing the pastor an email going, well, I can't believe you said this. I never heard this in my whole life. You've like totally torn my whole existence of Christianity. Get over it. Okay? Like become a solid food Christian because when you do that, you're going to have a greater faith in Jesus. In other words, don't be a two Corinthians member. Some people say, you know, Kumar, you're you, you just trying to do a controversial sermon series. Y'all, I'm too old for that. I'm 42 years old, okay? I do not. That, that was back in the 20s when you tried to get a rise out of people, okay? Like, there's no controversy here. What I want you to do is to be so on fire for your love for Jesus that you fully understand the Bible and how it was put together that you can now, no one will ever question your faith. Did you hear what I just said? Okay? And the way that you do that is by breaking it down and having a full understanding of how it comes together. My point in this series is to direct you to your Bible. Okay? If you're not opening up your Bible, if you're not in the Word of God, then you're going to miss the entire point of this series. Now, some people are going to be surprised by what I share with you next. You know, Pastor Steve, I was, uh, Pastor Steve was sitting with me yesterday. And he said, yeah, you're not going to make more people mad, are you, in this new series, sermon? And I said, no. But then I, like, wrote a new sermon. So, yes, I am. And, 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 and here's what I want to share with you. You know, a lot of people think that, um, a lot of people are surprised. People who really know me, they know that I'm actually a very conservative Christian. And they think that because I don't wear ties and I wear jeans to church and, you know, flamboyant socks and thank you for noticing you know and i talk very ordinarily ordinary right like they think that you know you're like this i don't know 
contemporary pastor. But I want to tell you a secret. I'm like a sheep in wool's clothing. Because I am, I am like really a very conservative Christian. Theologically, my, 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 um, my theology is extremely conservative and traditional. But the way that I practice Christianity is extremely progressive. Do you understand the difference in that? And so I'm going to share something with you that you probably have never, ever imagined Pastor Kumar would ever share in a public setting. I see Pastor Steve. He's getting scared. I love that. I love getting, I love seeing his face. He's like, should I look for a new job now? Because this dude's like going to blow up this church. But I'm going to share, I'm only going to share this once. I'm never going to share this again in a public setting, okay? But I want you to know really why I do what I do. Are you ready for this? Okay. There's this book that no one reads anymore called The Great Controversy by Ellen G. White, the founder of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And in fact, there's another book they wrote, they, 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 they created a few years ago called The Great Hope, right? They like sanitized it. But I'm telling you to read this book, okay? Because I want to prepare you for the end of times, okay? Because I'm going to get like really old school here because you guys, are, I'm never going to talk like this again, okay? But I'm, I want to scare you for a minute. I believe that Jesus is going to be coming very, very soon. And I mean like, maybe even within the next year. And if Jesus is coming very soon, everything that Ellen White says in the second half of the Great Controversy talks about what the end of time is going to look like. And she talks about in, 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 a, in a chapter called The Time of Trouble. And in that chapter, she talks about the idea that Seventh-day Adventist Christians are going to have to have their game on. You following me? So I want to share a couple of passages of, of what she says. She says, when the third angel's message closes, mercy no longer pleads for the guilty inhabitants of the earth. The people of God have what? Accomplish their work. So the third angel's message has closed now, and Jesus is about to come back. But before Jesus comes back, there's going to be some crazy stuff that happens. They have received the what? The latter rain, the refreshing of the presence of the Lord, and they are prepared for what? The trying hour before them. Do you know what the trying hour means? The trying hour means that there's going to be a time in the end of our of time, during the time of trouble, where every single one of us who say that we are Seventh-day Adventist Christians will be either persecuted or we will be questioned or put to our faith. And everything that you've believed in your life, that you've just been sitting in church your whole life, being handheld, spoon-fed by pastors, um, giving you information that you've never thought on your own, all of a sudden they're going to be putting information before you, and you're going to have to ask yourself, do I have enough information to stay strong in Jesus? So when your pastor said to you last week that a Bible was put together by committee. It wasn't to be controversial. It was so that you would be able to one day actually understand how the Bible came together and still have faith in God's word. Angels are hastening to and fro in heaven. An angel returning from the earth announces that his work is done. The final test has been brought upon the world, and all who have proved themselves loyal to the divine precepts have received what? The seal of the living God. And those who honor the law of God have been accused of bringing judgments upon the world, and they will be regarded as the cause of the fearful convulsions of nature and strife and blood, bloodshed among men that are filling the earth with woe. Now, here's where it gets deep. It says, the power attending the last warning has enraged the wicked. Their anger is what? Kindled against all who have received the message. And Satan will excite, will excite to still greater intensity the, the spirit of what? Hatred and persecution. So what she's saying is, I don't assume it's going to get better before it ends. Uh, even when Jesus has finished and the, and the third message has closed, 
it's going to even get harder, and Christians are going to be put to their test. And if you don't understand the full understanding of how the Bible was put together, if you don't fully understand the history of Christianity and the Sabbath, then you are not going to be able to stand firm and, and actually have answers to your accusers. Those professed, those professed Christians who come up to that last fearful conflict, what? Unprepared will in their despair confess their sins in words and burning anguish while the wicked exult over their distress. In other words, if you're not prepared and you don't even have an idea of how uh, and how to defend your faith, what she's saying is then you're going to be one of the first people that the wicked people are going to be very happy to, to deal with. These confessions are of the same character that that was of Esau or of Judas. Those who make them lament the result of transgression, but not as guilt. As Satan accuses the people of God on account of their sins, the Lord permits him to do what? To try them to the other, uttermost. What God is saying is, uh, you know, I'm not worried about what Satan is going to do to my faithful because I believe that they have the mark on them, that the, 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 the seal is upon them, and they're going to do great. And if you put your faith in God and you actually, actually do your research and do your study and, and be a faithful student of, of the Bible today, you're going to have no worries at the end of time. Y'all can't believe I'm saying this, can you? Their confidence in God, their faith and firmness will be severely tested as they review the past, their hopes sink. For in their whole lives, they can see little good. They are fully conscious of their weakness and unworthiness. Satan endeavors to what? Terrify them. Thank you, Eli. Good looking guy, isn't he? Ooh, it's T too. Thank you. 11 years old tomorrow. He was born in a snowstorm. <laughs> the day before he was born, we, I don't know why, but on that day it was snowing and we went and bought a minivan. <laughs> then he was born and then we picked him up in the minivan. It was awesome. <laughs> Love his hair too. I wish I had some. <clears throat> all right, all right, all right, let's go on. Satan endeavors to terrify them with the thought of their cases are hopeless, that the stain of the defilement will never be washed away. He hopes to destroy their faith. He hopes to destroy their faith. He hopes to destroy their faith, that they will yield to his temptations and turn from their allegiance to God. How do you prevent your faith from being destroyed? Being in the word of God. Being in the word of God. He hopes to destroy their faith that they will yield to his temptations and turn their allegiance to God. You know, um, Jerry Seinfeld's wife, Jessica, she wrote a cookbook a couple years ago. Have you seen it? Have you heard about it? It's called Deceptively Delicious. And it's how to like trick your kids into eating healthy food. And so she has recipes where she like, you know, you eat brownies, but really the brownies are like filled with spinach instead and the kids are like oh this is so great but she's like tricking them right and i feel like as a pastor what i my job is to de is to deceptively make the bible delicious okay uh to make you realize that um there are things that in the, that, that if i were to just tell you to read your bible and to understand your bible no one's going to do it but there you have to find a way to make the bible interesting and for you to be actually be into the word of god and so there's this tension that we're facing as Christians. And, and, and one of the tensions that exists, I think even at, at Oak Ridge, is, is that we're kind of living in between two spaces of time. Uh, we're, we're in what we call the modern age and the postmodern age. And I'm not, I'm not going to go into great detail about this today. But, but what the modern age is, is, is kind of what Adventism has been over the last 150 years. And that is that it's been linear thinking. It's been rational thinking. It's, it's filled with timelines and Newtonian uh, 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 um, uh, plans. And, and, and what, it, what it has done is, is that you're a Seventh-day Adventist, and no matter what we say, we say it, the, the truth is absolute. Have you heard that before? The truth is absolute. The Sabbath is absolute. We are Christians. It doesn't matter what you say. We, we, it is true because we said it's true. 
And now what we have is a postmodern thinking that, is, that has been influenced. And, and, and in postmodern culture, uh, you have everything is questioned. Because no, it, the Sabbath is not the Sabbath. You have to tell me why it's the Sabbath. I'm not going to just accept this as a truth. And so postmodern influence has, has now made you wonder uh, why you believe what you're doing. And so you, you have this kind of a split church. You have some people that are just happy with the pastor just spoon feeding you and giving you all the information that you need. And then there's other people in the church who aren't happy with that. Those are the people last week that were giving me high fives. Do I need to change my microphone as a battery? Like, Well, Mark, maybe you need to just speak for me then. If there's a doctor in the house, I need some medication. So postmodern and, and modern age. And so all of a sudden the facts are, are, are relative. Are you understanding what I'm saying here? So we're living in an age, there's this dualistic age that we're living in, and our congregation is mixed in both, where some people are just happy to be given the facts about the Bible, but other people are saying, you know what, this isn't good enough. I wouldn't even really know how the Bible is, is put together. And a good example of this is in the last 20 years in Christianity, uh, for those of you who understand the Saddleback model, um, Christianity basically said there's a, there's a triangle, and there's, 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 there's a... Th if you want to be a Christian, there's four ways to be a Christian. You go 101, 201, 301, 401, boom, you're a faithful Christian. And, and we followed this. We thought this was okay because this was kind of a modernistic way of, be, of being, being a Christian. But what we realized and learned is that it doesn't work that way anymore. There's no perfect uh, model or, 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 or recipe to being a Christian. It, it's all over the place. It's a journey. You have to kind of figure it out on your own. And, and, and Seventh-day Adventism is the same way. Uh, in, in, in 1980, when, when we put together this 27 Fundamental Beliefs uh, book, have you all seen this beliefs books, right? We were like, yeah, this is our creed. We don't believe in creeds, but this is our creed because we, you know, we're, we're Adventists and we're ne it's never going to change. And it's a 27 Fundamental Beliefs. And if you want to be a Seventh-day Adventist Christian, you got to go through all 27 fundamental beliefs. I was talking to a friend of mine. She's studying right now to, um, to be baptized at another church. And she said to me this week, she said, I love Jesus. I've gone through like three of the beliefs. Can, can they just like dunk me now? I want to get baptized. And, and the past, she told the pastor, she was like, I love Jesus. Like, thank you. This has been great. You've seen me like six times. Can I get baptized? He smiled. He says, we still have like another 19 more to go. You know, like, you know, this is kind of the absolute idea of, of modernism. You, you have to be rigid and follow the way things go. And, and, and I want to show you something because for, for some of you, you're going to go, you know, uh, how, how can we allow all, all of this um, openness in scripture? But I want to show you what happens even in Adventism. Have you seen that, um, you know, it's, you know, it's not 27 fundamental beliefs, right? It's 28 now, right? And I want you to see the, pre the preamble. Go back to the, to the, to the last, the last uh, slide. The preamble, because this is something that Adventists don't, don't ever look at. This is like page one of the, of the book. Okay, Seventh-day Adventists accept the Bible as their only creed and hold certain fundamental beliefs to be the teaching of Holy Scriptures. These beliefs are set forth here, constitute the church's understanding and expression of the teaching of the Scripture. Now, Done, period. We're done. That makes sense, right? But I want you to see how sneaky our Adventist leaders are, okay? They, they know you're not going to read this, okay? They know you're not going to read page one, okay? So they added this other sentence in here. What does it say? Revisions of these statements may be expected at the, what? You are shaking my faith, Kumar. You're telling me that they could revise this stuff? I thought this was like hardcore, absolute stuff. Revision of these statements may be expected at the general conversation when the church is what? Led by the what? What? You mean that the Holy Spirit 
can lead us to have a fuller understanding of God and knowledge over time? No, I thought we just had the 66 books of the Bible and that was it and now we're done. We can't have more knowledge along the way. Can that be possible? Revision of these statements may be ex ex expected at the general conversation when the church is led by the Holy Spirit to a fuller what? Understanding of the Bible. My friends, listen to me very carefully. If I wish I could stand up right now, but I don't have any leg energy, but just pretend I was standing up and jumping up and down right now. This is saying that as Christians, our knowledge of Jesus will never end. Our idea of who God is, our full understanding of the Bible will continue as the Holy Spirit shows us. It's not over. It's just part of the story. And it shouldn't make you lose your faith. It should make you realize that God still has stuff in store for us to know about him. Understanding the Bible truths or finds better language to which to express the teachings of God's holy words. That's so critical to find better language because language is always evolving, isn't it? And so if you want to articulate who God is, you're gonna always have to use the latest language in order to express who God is today. I wanna give you an example. If you were to look at our, our doctrines of Seventh-day Adventist in 1980, the Holy Scriptures, that's the number one doctrine, the Holy Scriptures. I'm gonna read it out loud. It says, the Holy Scriptures, Old and New Testament, are the written word of God, given by divine inspiration through holy what? Men of God who spoke and wrote as they, move, as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Now I want you to take a look at the next slide because what happened is, is, is that this doctrine was rewritten in 2015, was voted in the last general conference session. Can you tell me what the difference is in wording? Like, why did they revise it from 1980 to 2015? Do you see what the difference is? What is it? They now use gender inclusive language. And so instead of saying holy men, what did they say? Inspired authors. Now, you remember I told you how the Bible was put together by committee, and like, you know, and last week I showed you the Greek New Testament, and there's people who disagreed with, you know, voting on and the language, they kind of you know, expressed their, their point. Even in the Seventh-day Adventist Church in 2014 at the annual council, there was such a disagreement amongst the church leaders because many of the church leaders did not want to use gender-inclusive language. Uh, and, and, and they wanted to use the word, instead of holy men of God, they wanted to use holy persons of God. And there was such a big argument that finally in 2014, uh, uh, evangelist Mark Finley, one of the leaders in our church, finally came up with this really great language where he got everybody excited, and they said, instead of holy men of God, or holy persons of God, let us use the language inspired authors. And what they did is they said, they, we can do this because we're using this language from 2 Peter 1.20 and 1.21, and where the original Greek is gender inclusive for this language. Are you following what I'm saying? So they go back to the original and they say, the original Greek is itself gender inclusive, therefore we can be fair to use gender inclusive language. Now let me give you an example, the TNIV, I talked about it last, uh, last, uh, last week. Uh, TNIV just uses gender inclusive language whether or not the original text is gender inclusive or not. Okay, they just make a blanket, uh, uh, you know, he and she and uh, the, the, the neutral pronoun rather whether or not it's faithful to scripture. At least in this point, our Adventist leaders were saying, okay, in this case, we're using this passage of scripture from 1 Peter, and because it's gender inclusive, uh, gender inclusive, we're gonna also make it gender inclusive. Now, do you understand the difference in from 1980 to 2015, it took us this long a, a, a time to fully understand, and why did that happen? Because the Holy Spirit continues to work through his people. Finally, I wanna share that 
the Holy Scriptures, this is, I'm quoting from our doctrine, the Holy Scriptures are the supreme, authoritative, and what? Infallible revelation of his will. They are the standard of character, the test of experience, the definitive revealer of doctrines, and the trustworthy record of God's acts. Folks, those four points is why we have scripture alone. Those four points is why you should read the scripture, because it's a standard of character. It tests your experience. It's a definitive revealer of what we believe, and it is a trustworthy record of God. And what you have to ask yourself is, can I believe in the Bible, and is this good enough for me? And then you look at it, and it says, the Bible scriptures are infallible. Do you know what the word infallible means? It means absolutely trustworthy something that you can put your count you you can count on okay do you understand the difference between the word infallible and inerrant inerrant means that it is free from error now i want you to be very clear and follow what i'm saying here and that is that our even our seventh day adventist doctrine under the line scripture, made it very clear to say that scriptures are infallible. It's something that you can trust. But it never has said that scriptures are inerrant. Because there are parts of scripture that don't make sense. There are parts of scripture, and I don't know when I'm going to preach that today's sermon, but you know, sometime in the future about how the Bible contradicts itself. There are parts of scripture that do contradict itself. And what you have to be willing to do as a Christian is be willing to trust in God that he's bigger than all of us, even if the Bible contradicts itself. Are you following me? Are you about to jump off a cliff? Are you like about to like lose your faith over all of this? So the question we have to ask ourselves is, can I trust the Bible? Can I trust the Bible? Here are five things I think you need to ask yourself when you look at the Bible and understand how the Bible is put together. Number one, does the Bible explain the, or, the or, um, origin story satisfactorily? Meaning, the whole point of the Bible, what is the meta story of the Bible? It's God's love for humanity. So does the Bible explain the origin story satisfactorily? satisfactorily? Are you, do you believe that the Bible actually tells us how we came, how we existed and where we're going? If that's good enough for you, then the Bible should be good enough for you. Number two, does the Bible point you to God's desire to save the human race? You see, when you read the Bible, you should be able to fully understand that the whole point of the Bible is for God, for God to help you realize that he's crazy in love with you and he wants to save you. Number three, does the Bible provide answers to your questions? Like when you are depressed, when you are frustrated, when you don't know where to go, does the Bible have passages in this, in this scripture that gives you hope and provide answers for you to get through the next day? Number four, does the Bible encourage you to live a better life? If you don't read your Bible and you don't believe that the Bible actually helps you to become a better person, then I don't know what you're reading. And then finally, number five, does the Bible provide hope to a better future is what it should say. Here are two things that I think that are ruining your Bible experience. Are you ready for it? Are you ready for it? The, I, these are deep, okay? Here are two things that are ruining your Bible. You're going, Kumar, you're telling me to read the Bible, but it's boring. Kumar, you're telling me to read the Bible, but I don't get it. Kumar, you're telling me I, I don't, I, uh, to read the Bible. Here's two things that are ruining your Bible experience. Number one, Netflix, okay? And, and when I say Netflix, what I mean by that is um, our saturation for media, okay? If, if you don't find the Bible interesting, it's because you have to learn to, reta uh, to retrain your taste buds. You see, Game of Thrones is always going to be more interested, interesting the Bi than, the, than, than what you're reading in the Bible. Do you know why? Because it's created by the devil. 
And when you binge watch like nine hours, 14 hours of, of TV, and then you tell me I can't read the Bible, it's because you have retrained your taste buds for what is evil than what is God adoring, okay? How many of y'all, y'all drink sweet and low? Or use sweet and low in your drinks? I, I use sweet and low. I'm addicted to sweet and low. And if you see me, Pastor Steve was with me yesterday. We had coffee. I had four cups of coffee, maybe six cups yesterday together in a span of two hours. And I put like three to four sweet and lows in my coffee. It's disgusting, okay? But do you know sweet and low is like 100 times sweeter than sugar, right? So what happens now? People who drink sweet and low are so accustomed to things being so sweet that when you have sugar, it, it, it's false, right? It, you, you don't really have the full taste. You need it to be even sweeter because it's changed the way that you think it, it, the, of what is actually sweet. In the same way, when, you, when you're watching Netflix or you know, whatever you do, the, you know, um, movies or, 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 or TV or anything, what you're doing is you're retraining and rewiring your, bio, your, your, your mind to something that you are not going to fully engage or appreciate any longer. Do I sound like a fundamentalist to you all of a sudden? I, th- I think I'm listening to myself going, what are you saying, Kumar? You sound like conservative. But the reality is, is that if you want to be in love with God's words, you're going to have to get rid of some other stuff. The second thing that you got to get rid of is social media. Okay, now you're going, all right, my wife's looking at me going, what? No, I love my Facebook. You know what I did this week? I went through, because I was sick in bed, I went through Facebook and I like unfollowed like almost all of you. And then after I unfollowed all of you, I unfollowed like all the news um, that I am on, all like BuzzFeed. Anybody is on BuzzFeed? Okay, BuzzFeed is the best. But you know what I found out or I realized is that almost all of BuzzFeed stuff is inappropriate. It's stuff I don't even want my kids to see. And, and, and it gets you deeper and deeper, takes you off, and what it does is it, it corrupts your senses. And if you want to get fully into God's word, you're going to have to avoid being corrupted by all this nonsense that you have online. Somebody needs to say amen. You're all like looking at me like you're stunned. Okay, I'm going to close right now. So what's the next step? I should have had a wheelchair or something up here. I needed to be on wheels or something. Yeah, I should have done that. All right, what's next? I'm going to stand up for this part. That way you feel like I'm, li- I'm going to end. You've got to become a student of his word. And do you know how you become a student of his word? I'm not saying a casual reader of his word. I'm not saying like, you know, an occasional reader of God's word. Do you know what it means to be a student of his word? It means you have to study for hours. That means there's no time for Netflix. There's, 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 there's no time for Homeland. There's, 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 there's no time for a Game of Thrones. You, you, you have to be able to be in the Word of God. It means you have to have your Bible out. You can't get like some thin Bible. You gotta get a big, old, huge, heavy Bible with notes in it and, 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 and a nice uh, .3 pen where you're uh, underlining and, and, and adding notes in there and you're researching and you're studying the Word of God. You're getting a commentary because if you spend your time in God's Word at the end of time, He's going to be, be faithful to you. Number two. Hit the next slide. I lost, I lost where I am. You got to spend more time in really figuring out what's in Scripture than what's in Star Wars. Some of you are Star Wars experts. You know one through six. You know what every one of these stupid things on the screen is for. You know, you have like this collection in your house, okay? But you can't even tell me where to find Deuteronomy. Are you following me? Okay, so, so don't be an expert. Like when you, when you tell me, oh, you know, yes. I, I don't even, I, I can't even give you an example of Star Wars because I think it's stupid, but, you know, like, whatever it is, you tell me, you're telling me how much you know about Star Wars. I want to tell you, you're stupid, okay? Like, like read God's word. Don't be an expert on, on this kind of nonsense. Be an expert on God's word. Next slide. So, I said you got to be a student of God's word, okay? You, you got to, like, be, like, a nerd. You got to be a geek. You got to, like, get a pen. You got to get a ruler. You got to underline scripture. You got to be into it. You got you to be so into it that it becomes interesting. 
And then you've got to fill your mind with Scripture. You know, I download uh, the, the Bible. I listen to the Bible. Like when I'm running, can you tell I've been running, Peter? Huh? You know, I, I, when I'm running, I'm not like listening to like, you know, the latest contemporary tunes on, on Google Play. I'm listening to Scripture because I want my mind to be filled with God's Word. Now, am I like listening to it and memorizing it? No, I'm not. Like, sometimes I'm daydreaming. I'm, I'm thinking about other things. But what I'm doing is I want all of that God scripture to be put into my mind rather than to, for me to put more garbage into my mind. So go spend 60 bucks. Uh, this is the one that I own, the Bible experience. It's like, you know, all the um, black Hollywood actors reading scripture to like dramatic sounds and music. It's awesome. Okay, like listen to scripture. Some of you are going to go spend 60 bucks today buying Star Wars junk. Go buy this. Download it. Next slide. And then memorize scripture. We have fallen out of the memorization of scripture. That is something we don't do anymore. But I want to tell you something. The more you memorize scripture, at the end of time, during the time of trouble, God is going to bring that scripture back into your mind. When you need scripture, you don't have to go see your shrink and tell them how depressed you are. You can pull up out of your mind words of encouragement that God gives you because you have been faithful to his word. God, today as we have kind of taken a back step and And as we have kind of re-examined uh, why we believe what we believe, God, I pray that um, these members' faith won't be shaken, but rather be strengthened. God, I, I ask that you forgive us for making you the last on our list. I'm including myself. I ask you to forgive us for, for allowing everything else to take interest rather than to open up the word and, and read the scriptures. And God, today I pray that starting right now that you will break our hearts for you. That we will turn our hearts towards what's important and not worry about pop culture and worry about what's happening in the world, but that what we will be so deeply seated into scripture that our lives will be radically changed by your grace. Amen. Well, yeah, let's give Kumar a hand. I was very blessed by that. Uh, I just want to welcome you to Oak Ridge. It's good to see all your beautiful faces today. And uh, if you're here for the first time, I'm glad you're visiting. And my name is Brendan Zabatichny. And after that sermon about not being on social media, I don't think I have a job anymore. Because <laughs> that's mostly what I do. <laughs> um, but thank you so much for coming today. Um, right now, I just want to invite the deacons forward uh, while we're about to do the offering call. And while they come up, I just want to remind you guys that you can also give online. Um, we have a part on our website that says giving. You can do that for that. And also in the back, we have the Square app if you have your credit card or anything else like that. Um, let's just bow our heads for the offering. Dear Heavenly Father, uh, just thank you so much for your word and the opportunity and the blessing we have that we are in a safe place to open your word and to actually just have it. God, and I hope that we take that opportunity and just really uh, learn more about you through this and that we can be inspired by that as well. And God, I just want to pray for the blessing of the offering today um, because God, I see that through our generosity that uh, you are glorified and that we can also do uh, things for others in the ministry that we do, God. Thank you so much that we're here for this 
for this Saturday. And you know, I pray. Amen. So while they take the offering, I just want to tell you guys about a couple things. Um, first is seven minutes or less. If you are a visitor, this is your first, second, third time, we just want to welcome you here. Not just by me saying it, but we want to spend some time with you, and we want to give you a gift bag, and also it'll be just right here on the side. We want to get to know you a little bit, tell you about our church, but we want to hear more about your life and about you and keep in touch with you a little bit. So please come to the side after that. And right now, we're just going to play a video. Sweet. Think Green, um, it's really great. You get to meet a whole bunch of people from all over town. Everyone seems very enthusiastic and very fun. I've been doing this Think Green for over uh, a good six months now. And the food looks really great. It makes eating vegan food really accessible to an average person. It kind of gives somebody who's new to vegan eating uh, really good creative ideas for what to cook for yourself. The presentations are always really good. Steven is so enthusiastic and friendly. Um, they give you tips on uh, foods that you can buy in the grocery store, what stores to go to, where to get the cheapest, best vegan products. It's like having your own personal chef who's already tried and tested everything before beforehand so that they can give you the best possible product to try yourself at home. So just a really great event. Absolutely love it. And I love it. I think the presentation is awesome. If you're in the Vancouver area, you should definitely check them out. Meetup.com. Or White Rock. And the White Rock too. Check out the White Rock or, the or here in Vancouver. It's just an, a no-brainer for anyone to come and try it out. So it's great. Come along. So that's... Uh Think Green Supper Club. That's actually happening this Wednesday. And my first day on the job a couple months ago, this happened. And I've never felt community like that before. It was so neat to see all the different people, a lot of them that aren't church members that are coming to this. So if you want to come, I know there's, you can sign up by going on meetup.com and just RSVP there. And uh, we'd love to see you there. And right now I'm going to invite Peter Paul to come up and talk about some young adult events that are happening. Thanks, Brendan. Hi, my name is Peter Paul. I'm one of the young adult leaders for the young adults. Um, two things. First thing is we have a game board night tonight at Pastor Steve's house. If you want to know more about it, um, just meet us back there um, in that room and then we'll tell you about that. Second thing is we're having another uh, Whistler young adult retreat. So if you are coming or if you're interested in coming or if you just want to know a little bit more, uh, just meet us back there right after church, and um, Joanne and I will be back there to talk to you. Thanks, Brendan. Thanks, Peter Paul. Um, before I forget, if you took the church survey today, um, we're going to be collecting them at the back. So please don't forget. Don't leave it in your pocket, and you'll bring it home. That happens to me all the time. Um, just a couple more things. The next thing is the Vancouver Sun Run. Um, we've talked about it a couple times. I was, I was kind of thinking about wearing my running clothes to, and telling you about it, but then I would regret that and you would not want to see what that looks like. Um, they're very short shorts or very tight tights. Um, but I love running. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a diehard runner, and the sun run is one of my favorite things. get to run with a ton of people. Um, it can be overwhelming, but we would love to have you on our team. You get to wear a shirt. Um, we're all joining the Let's Move Vancouver, and I'll tell you quickly if you don't know how to do it. You go to the website and you actually get to choose what team you get to go on. Please click on that and type in Let's Move Vancouver and you join the team. And if you have any more questions, please email us or something because we've had a couple people who said, oh, I, I did it and I didn't know what I was doing, but I did it anyways. And we're like, oh, we would have liked to have you on our team. So check that out, we love, the sun run is not hard even if you're not a runner, it's just fun. And yeah, it's a great way to meet people too. Um, the last thing we have is, um, our AGM, our, it's our general meeting, but the great part about it is it's kind of how we get to see what the church is up to. So on February 27th at 5.30, we want to invite any of you and all of you, the more people, the more fun, because during that time, we're going to talk about the year that we had in 2015. We do a little bit of um, just covering that and also our vision, just looking at what we're doing in 2016 as well. But then after that, we're going to have what we're calling our leap year party. And we're going to have tons of food and games and just celebration. A great way to just look at, just celebrate what we've been through in the last year and what we're going to be going forward with. Um, so we'd love to see you there. And thanks again for coming today. And have a wonderful day.
Let's stand together as we sing. We need a, a bass guitar up. Father God, we just pause in your presence. We pause in your presence to thank you that you were here, that we were able to worship, that we were brought closer, that we were pushed to think about how we relate to you and your word, what role does it play in our lives, how are we best to use it to move our relationship with you forward.
Father, we just want to recommit to reading your word. We want to recommit to inviting you to help us understand it, uh, that we don't have to read it alone, that we can read it in community, that we can join small groups, Bible studies, uh, ways to wrestle through it. Father, we just invite your presence uh, to give us the level of conviction we need to actually do that. In the meantime, Father, we want to lift up Pastor Kumar, who bravely came out here in the midst of his illness to preach. And Father, we pray that he feels better soon. Um, and for everybody, and may all God's people together in unison say, we love you, Jesus. Amen. Just a couple of things before we let you go. We had 77 viewers online. Can you believe it? What? <laughs> That's crazy. Um, but we'd rather you be here with us. But some of you can't. So those of you in Germany, Silver Springs, Maryland, Loma Linda, Quebec, Toronto, Calgary, Alberta, Kelowna, Abbotsford, Coquitlam. Coquitlam, you're close enough to be here. Abbotsford, I get. Anyways, we welcome you all online. We're so thankful that you're joining us. We hope you're enjoying our new online platform. Please join some of us to the left here for seven minutes or less. We want to give you some gifts, get to know you. We also want to pray for you. If there's something you need prayed for, our elders are here, Phil is here, Trish is here. They will pray over you. They will speak God's good gifts into your life. Otherwise, we love you. God bless. Enjoy the rest of your Sabbath day. Amen.